This November, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. Theirs is one royal marriage that has stood the test of time and helped keep the monarchy secure. But back in the 1940s, when the teenage Elizabeth fell for the dashing Philip, it was a very different story. In the eyes of her family, courtiers and the public, the young Prince Philip of Greece was a far from ideal son. Rough, uneducated and not likely to be faithful, thought the court. Rather unpolished, Teutonic, Charlie Kraut. In a newspaper poll, nearly half the nation was against the match. Definitely no to a marriage with a foreign prince. But luckily for the couple, there was a third person in this romance. Philip's Uncle Dickie, Lord Louis Mountbatten, fixer extraordinaire. This is the forgotten story of a royal love match fraught with a series of obstacles, and how, through behind-the-scenes manipulation, Philip's Uncle Dickie helped pull it off, just. The story begins in 1939. Elizabeth was 13 years old, the heir to the throne, and a serious-minded girl of strong feelings. Prince Philip of Greece was 18, a handsome young sailor of uncertain prospects. And Lord Louis Mountbatten, Philip's uncle, was a very ambitious man with a passion for intrigue. That summer, on the eve of war, all three were to meet. In July 1939, the royal family visited the Royal Naval College, Dartmouth in Devon. A young cadet joined the party, Prince Philip of Greece, who was training at Dartmouth for the British Navy. He was very dashing, he certainly was. He was somebody that you would certainly look at if he came into the room. Because you think, oh, who is this? this good-looking young man. Elizabeth and Philip played croquet, and the scene was captured by a passing amateur photographer. The princess was smitten by the good-looking, much older cadet. I think at that age, one is rather enthralled by brave young men who go to war. And I always suspect that uh, the love affair sort of was originally kindled there. Mountbatten, as the King's naval ADC, was also there that day, and he noticed Elizabeth's interest in his nephew. After a visit to the royal yacht, the Victoria and Albert, he recorded in his diary. Philip came back aboard the V&A for tea and was a great success with the children. Mountbatten was a man of immense personal and dynastic ambition. As a second cousin of George VI, he was on the fringes of the royal family, but he wanted to put himself and the Mountbattens centre stage. He had been a close friend of Edward VIII, but he'd lost that connection when Edward abdicated. Now Mountbatten could see a new route to the royals through his good-looking nephew, Philip. He was an inveterate matchmaker. He was certainly determined to find a suitable match for his nephew, Prince Philip. And could there be a better match than the heir presumptive to the British throne? I think not. But Mountbatten's idea of a future match between Elizabeth and Philip was littered with obstacles. For the future Queen of England, his background was far from ideal. Like Elizabeth, Philip was royal, and the pair were distant cousins. He too was one of the many descendants of Victoria and Albert's prolific brood, but he was from one of the less illustrious branches. His grandfather, Prince William of Denmark, was in 1863 imported by the Greeks to be their king. In royal terms, the Greek monarchy was poor. It was also one of the least stable in Europe. In 1922, following an unsuccessful war with Turkey, Philip's father, Prince Andrew, a general in the Greek army, was forced to flee the country. The family's downward slide had begun. Philip was thrown out of Greece with all his family when he was a baby. He never 
in effect, knew Greece as a young man at all. And from then on, uh, they led a pretty harem scarum life. They lived in exile in Paris, Philip and his four older sisters wearing hand-me-downs from richer relatives. The strain of their circumstances soon told on the family. Before he was 10, Prince Philip's parents split up. His mother had a kind of nervous breakdown. Sounds like a form of manic depression. She was incarcerated in a clinic in Switzerland. The consequence was that she didn't see her family, wasn't in touch with Prince Philip, literally for years on end, not a postcard, not a Christmas card, not a birthday card, nothing. Philip's father moved to Monte Carlo with his mistress. The family fell apart. Philip was taken under the wing of his wealthy English relatives, the Mountbattens, who paid his school fees and took him in during holidays. In royal terms, Philip was a boy from the wrong side of the tracks. And Elizabeth was still only a child, and this just a crush. But Mountbatten, once bitten by an idea, never gave up. For now, there was a war to fight. But at the next suitable opportunity, Mountbatten was going to do everything he could to further a match and advance his own dynastic ambitions. Four years of war had kept Prince Philip of Greece and Princess Elizabeth apart. By 1943, Philip was a lieutenant in the British Navy, mentioned in dispatches for bravery. Elizabeth was now a young woman of 17. She had spent most of her war cloistered away at Windsor Castle. Lord Louis Mountbatten, Philip's uncle, still hoped for a match between the pair. Christmas 1943 at Windsor. Elizabeth was playing Aladdin in the annual family pantomime. Among the guests was Philip. Elizabeth's governess noticed his effect on the princess and recorded it in her memoirs. Lilibet came to see me looking rather pink. Who do you think's coming to see us at Crawfee? Philip. I have never known Lilibet more animated. There was a sparkle about her none of us had ever seen before. Many people remarked on it. Princess Elizabeth had led quite a restricted life at Windsor, with doting parents, with animals and loving staff around her, but she hadn't seen the world. She was confronted by Prince Philip, someone who'd been about a bit. He was very exciting indeed. She was swept off her feet. From then on, the two young people began to correspond. She took an immense interest in him, where he was and on what ship. Mountbatten was delighted to hear about the renewed friendship between Elizabeth and Philip both for his nephew and for himself. He was determined to do what he could to turn this into more than a passing attraction. And to this end, he would bring his own unique range of talents. He was a man of extraordinary courage, both physical and moral. He was decent, he was generous. He was as good a person to have on your side if you were in trouble as you could possibly imagine. He was also the most monstrous cheat and liar. Uh, he found it very hard to distinguish between what he thought, what he wanted to be the truth, what actually was the truth. Mountbatten was now supreme allied commander in Southeast Asia, responsible for winning the war against Japan. But he was never too busy to take important family matters in hand. Philip's cousin, the King of Greece, was also in favour of the prestigious match. Mountbatten encouraged him to write to George VI, asking if Philip could become a suitor to Elizabeth. George VI's response? No. Mountbatten had overplayed his hand. He had underestimated something important. The close relationship between Elizabeth and her father. George VI was a shy, awkward man who relied heavily on his daughter's companionship, and he didn't want to let her go just yet. The king was ambivalent about Philip. Um, on the one hand, he liked the fact he was a naval officer. On the other hand, he had 
these possessive reservations about losing his daughter. I think the king was shocked at the idea that his daughter might have an independent, emotional, sexual life that she now wanted to pursue. It was much too early for him. He loved the little family unit. With time, Mountbatten could deal with the king's possessiveness. But there was a far bigger obstacle ahead. Philip's unfortunate links with Nazi Germany. There was no denying it. Prince Philip had German blood and German relatives. Of his sisters, all of them were married to German princelings. One of them had been married to an SS officer. Philip's family had Germanic origins. They were members of the house of Schleswig-Holstein Sonderberg Glücksburg. Following the family breakup, all his sisters had reverted to a German identity. Sophie, Philip's youngest sister, married Prince Christoph of Hesse in 1930. He was made a colonel in Hitler's SS. Teasingly, Queen Elizabeth called Prince Philip the Hun, and uh, he pretended to be amused by it, but I think actually it rather niggled with him. Let's not forget, this is a royal family that changed its German name to be called Windsor in the previous war. So to fit in with a family coming from Schlosses and Boar Hunts and Bavaria and so on, just, you know, didn't make any sense at all. For the royal family, Philip's Germanness at a time of war would be a public relations own goal. Mountbatten realized the only way to put his nephew in the running was if Philip's unwelcome foreign connections, both Greek and German, could be removed from the picture. Philip needed to become British. To get Philip naturalized as a British citizen, there was important groundwork for Mountbatten to do. In August 1944, he flew to Cairo, where he met the exiled King of Greece, Philip's cousin. Mountbatten persuaded him to allow Philip to abandon his Greek nationality. The plan was off to a good start. But back in Britain, there was something else afoot. Elizabeth's strong-minded mother had her own plans for her very marriageable daughter. There's a wonderful story that the Queen Mother drew up a first 11 of contenders for her daughter. Um, and as somebody said, she certainly didn't put in Philip to open the batting. On the Queen's list were Charles, 10th Duke of Rutland, Johnny Dalkeith, the future Duke of Buccleuch, and Lord Porchester, a close friend of the princess. All these young men were heirs to vast estates and fortunes. Small parties were organized, and Elizabeth's parents kept their fingers tightly crossed. Mountbatten was going to have to work fast. Today is victory in Europe day. The end of the war with Germany in May 1945 meant things were looking up. Perhaps Philip's foreignness would not be such a problem now. Elizabeth had just turned 19 and was showing signs of an independent spirit. I think we all said we must go out and join in the celebrations, you know. London was just full of people screaming with joy. And luckily, the King and Queen allowed them to. The Princess Little wore her ATS uniform and with her cap on. Nobody would have had a clue who she was. It was lovely for her, she could be completely anonymous. Philip was still fighting in the Far East, where the war continued. Elizabeth and he were still corresponding. Despite the young aristocrats dangled in front of her, Elizabeth had not lost interest in the handsome naval officer, as her governess observed. One day, I suddenly became aware that she had his picture on her mantelpiece. Is that altogether wise? People will begin all sorts of gossip about you. She looked at the photograph for a moment thoughtfully. Oh dear, I suppose they will. 
the next time I went into her room, the picture had disappeared. In its place, there was another one. There you are, Crawfee. I defy anyone to recognize who that is, said Lilibet. He's completely incognito in that one. So Philip is a little touch of naughtiness, not doing exactly what her parents want. But her quite firmly saying, I like this, I want this for myself, and I'm going to have it. With Elizabeth standing up to her parents, things were looking up. But Mountbatten was in danger of overplaying his hand with Philip. His frequent letters of advice ran the risk of putting his headstrong nephew off the match. Philip liked Elizabeth, but there were times when he resisted his uncle's interference. I am not being rude, but it is apparent that you like the idea of being the general manager of this little show, Philip later warned him. Mountbatten was also chivying George VI to much better effect. The king had not agreed to the match, but he had agreed to talk to his government about the need to naturalize Philip and make him a British citizen. But now there was a fresh obstacle looming in Mountbatten's path, the government itself. Earlier that year, a new socialist government had swept to power, led by Clement Attlee. Labour Party's great victory shows that the country is ready for a new policy. The new government had inherited a dirty little war in Greece. If there was one country one wouldn't particularly have wanted a suitor uh, to the princess to be coming from at that particular moment for a Labour government, it was Greece. Philip's Greek antecedents were now a real problem. Greece's bitter civil war loomed. On one side, the communists, on the other side, the pro-monarchy right, who wanted to reinstate Philip's family on the throne. Britain was caught between the two. It was a war to the death, really, as civil wars always are. We didn't want the communists to take over because the Cold War had begun and we didn't want to see the Russians controlling Greece but we didn't want the monarchy either. British troops had been fighting to prevent the Greek communists from taking over the country. Labour Party left-wing backbenchers were increasingly appalled, accusing the government of supporting Greece's authoritarian far right. Naturalising Philip would have sent a signal to people generally, and particularly to the Labour left, that the Labour government had thrown in its lot completely. Uh, with the Greek royal family and with the, with the, with the writing in, in, in Greece. Faced with the prospect of backbench rebellion and diplomatic trouble, Attlee told the king that naturalizing Philip could not be considered until the Greek situation had stabilized. International politics were now holding the match back. What would Dickie Mountbatten do next? With the Second World War over, Lord Louis Mountbatten was at a loose end and looking for his next big job. His efforts to marry his nephew to Princess Elizabeth were blocked because the government was still stalling on making Philip a British citizen. On the plus side, Philip was now back from the war and the romance was hotting up. I noticed suddenly that Lilibet began to take more trouble with her appearance, that it seemed to matter more to her what she wore at this evening party or that. Then I would find that Philip had been there. When in London, Philip stayed at his uncle's house in Belgravia, where even the butler was catching on to what was afoot. Whenever Philip bought a weekend bag and I unpacked it, I always found a small photograph in a battered leather frame. A photograph of Princess Elizabeth. Having played the field during the war, Philip was now set on Elizabeth. I think Prince Philip was drawn to Princess Elizabeth because she was very beautiful indeed. Intelligent, caring.
In the summer of 1946, Philip was invited to join the royal family and the court at Balmoral. With all other contenders out of the running, it was time for the court to pass judgment on Mountbatten's young protege. Balmoral would provide the setting for the first of his famous gaffes. The story goes that wearing a kilt, he bobbed a curtsy to the king. The king was gently amused. Prince Philip was a young man with a playful sense of humor. The courtiers were outraged. Tommy Lassells, the king's private secretary, really had a downer on Prince Philip. Sir Alan Lassells described the court's estimation of Philip. Rough, uneducated, and not likely to be faithful. These stuffy folk brought up late Victorian Edwardian times felt themselves more royal in a way than the royals. They understood what the job required and what the institution required to keep it going. So they looked at Philip with a very critical eye. Philip's brusque manner and his foreign origins grated on the courtiers. Rather unpolished, Teutonic, no gentleman, Charlie Kraut. They also wondered if there wasn't the whiff of the fortune hunter about him. Prince Philip had no private means. He had a little bit of an allowance from Lord Mountbatten. He had his naval salary, but he lived with frayed cuffs. He didn't have a change of dinner clothes. But most of all, the courtiers disliked Philip because he was Mountbatten's nephew. Through Philip, they feared that pushy Dicky Mountbatten would try to wield influence at court. Maybe it was all part of a deliberate test, like the Foreign Office is said to have done in those days, you know, put someone in a country house for a few days and see how they behave and try and trip them up. And Philip is quite clear, um, was quite happy to be tripped up and be himself and commit gaffes in their terms. And I think it also shows that he was pretty confident of the affection and love of Elizabeth. And he didn't give a damn what these people thought and he was going to be himself. So Philip ignored the icy atmosphere and forged ahead. He proposed to Elizabeth and was accepted. Elizabeth's father, still reluctant to let his daughter go, asked for the engagement to be kept secret. Meanwhile, in London, the Home Office was still stalling on the request to make Philip a British citizen. So Mountbatten now went on the offensive and took on the government himself. The wheels were grinding very slowly. And I think there was no doubt that Mountbatten decided that they had to be oiled a bit and pushed a bit. And he did have considerable pull. He was well known and well liked by the Labour ministers at the time and he felt perfectly capable of saying to them, look, um, can you please help this operation along? Mountbatten secured meetings with the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister, who, despite the worsening situation in Greece, were persuaded to look favorably on Philip's application. Jubilantly, Mountbatten sent his nephew the form to fill in. But just as everything was falling into place, events once again took an unwelcome turn. Until now, knowledge of Elizabeth and Philip's romance had been restricted to court circles. But tabloid newspapers had been aware of rumors of a relationship for months. And suddenly, her romance with the foreign prince was public. Lassells, the king's private secretary, made a public statement. There is no engagement. Well, I think for beady-eyed people, denial suggests the inevitability <laughs> of confirmation at a later stage. A society wedding soon provided the press with more evidence of the romance. Ironically, it was the wedding of one of Mountbatten's own daughters. I think the first time that the press really felt there might be something more going on. Funnily enough, it happened to be at my wedding in October of 46 when I married Lord Brayman. And there was a picture taken by one of the newspapers at the entrance to Rumsey Abbey 
uh, where the princesses were just going in because they were bridesmaids with my sister. And um, Prince Philip was one of the ushers and he was standing there waiting to help people. And uh, Princess Elizabeth was taking off her coat and he took it from her. And for some reason that gesture triggered something in the press and they, their ears went up and they thought, ah, oh, is there something in this? Shortly after, a small item appeared in the Times, a report that Philip had filed his application for naturalization. The news that Philip might soon become British meant one thing to the press and public. Despite the denials, an engagement announcement was imminent. But instead of being charmed by Elizabeth's romance, the public had serious doubts about her choice. There was a new problem for Mountbatten. In January 1947, a newspaper ran a nationwide poll. Should our future queen wed Philip? 40% were against the foreign prince. This is a match that is not going down that well at all. I mean, 40%, according to polls, are opposed, and they're opposed on the grounds that he's a foreigner. This was a war-weary population, and in many ways, a very xenophobic population. Most of the 40% who opposed the betrothal were men. Most of them were ex-servicemen. Uh, and letters to the papers said things like, you know, I'm a father with two sons. We, the Russell family, a father and two sons who have served in both wars, say definitely no to a marriage to a foreign Any prince. Any consolidated link with the Greek royal family would be eyed with suspicion. In I am very years. much against Princess Elizabeth marrying a foreigner. If she marries We, who have always been great supporters of our royal family, feel that we must add our names to the list. Surely someone of good British stock could be found. It would obviously be very ridiculous to link up with the Greeks, who will always be in trouble with someone. The poll revealed a significant proportion of the public was as much against Philip and his foreignness as the court. It was a setback for the credibility of the match. And now Elizabeth and Philip were to be separated. In February 1947, the King and Queen took Elizabeth off on a four-month tour of South Africa. The trip had been long planned but now provided useful distance from the controversy. There's no doubt at all that um, the trip to South Africa was seen as one more test of their affection for each other. And who knows if they didn't wonder whether she wouldn't you know, meet somebody to dance or something might happen. Back in Britain, Mountbatten was doing crucial PR work. The announcement of Philip's naturalization was imminent so he had to step up his efforts to win round the press and public. If Philip was portrayed as Johnny Foreigner, he could kiss goodbye to his chances of marrying Elizabeth. To win the nation over, making Philip British on paper was not enough. He had to succeed in spinning a new image of his nephew. Mountbatten was a master manipulator of the media through various contacts in the press, behind the scenes manipulation and friends in high places. He made quite sure that a very favorable image of Prince Philip did emerge or was presented to the British people. Tom Dryberg, the well-connected Labour MP and journalist, was a friend of Mountbatten's, who he enlisted to help win over the press. Mountbatten had given Dryberg a biographical press pack about Philip which he'd written himself. It stressed that Philip spoke no Greek, had spent no more than three months of his life in Greece, and that in all his allegiances and interests, he could not be more British. Dryberg made good use of the information, as did Mountbatten's other friends on Fleet Street. My earliest memory was a photograph of him playing cricket. And since I was a passionate cricketer and cricket supporter, I thought this is a good thing if we have uh, somebody marrying into the royal household who plays cricket. I'm not sure how often he played. This may have been the only occasion he ever held the bat. But I can vividly remember sunglasses, very unusual, Prince Philip bowling and batting. And I thought as a 15, 16-year-old boy, right stuff, I thought, right stuff. As part of his repackaging, Philip dropped his royal title 
and acquired a new surname. His uncle's, naturally enough. You really couldn't have the Queen marrying somebody with the surname Schleswig Holstein Sonderberg Luxburg, could you? Mount Batten, of course, sounds properly British. It wasn't. It was the name Battenberg that had become a British name during the First World War, when we were last having a row with the Germans. In March 1947, Philip's naturalization was granted. The transformation was complete. He was now Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, a cricket-playing Englishman and a suitable consort for the future Queen. With family affairs in order, Mountbatten could move on to the challenge of his new job, last Viceroy of India. In May, the royal family returned from South Africa. Elizabeth's feelings for Philip hadn't changed. Elizabeth pined for him, she wrote him letters, um, and uh, came back all the more determined. The king and queen bowed to the inevitable. Philip was to be their son-in-law. Mountbatten had won his eight-year campaign. In anybody's life, engagement day is a red letter day. Princess Elizabeth and Lieutenant Mount Batten will never forget July the 10th, 1947. In the morning, they face the world's press and photographers. Elizabeth finally had the man she wanted. She was going to marry the handsome sailor she'd fallen for eight years ago when she was just 13. But the problems for the couple, the royal family and Mount Batten were still far from over. No longer is Philip suitable now it was a question of what kind of wedding would be appropriate in a time of austerity. This question would dog all concerned in the months to come and raise concerns about the credibility of the monarchy itself. The announcement of Elizabeth and Philip's engagement had played well with the press and public. Now the palace and the government decided to capitalize on the good feeling and make their wedding in November a lavish public event. Until now, royal weddings had usually been private affairs, but this was to be held at Westminster Abbey and be a day of national celebration. But the plan could backfire, because many in the country just weren't in the mood. It was a tremendously tricky time to put on a royal wedding. Most people had had a really tough time during the war and suffered real hardship and the idea that suddenly there was going to be this wonderful sort of golden parade of opulence seemed a tremendous risk. Two years on from the end of war and the election of an idealistic Labour government, and nothing much had changed. The economy was on its knees, and life for many was miserable. Rationing was more severe than during the war. There were power failures, strikes, and a housing crisis, and a general feeling of malaise. For the most disillusioned and fed up among the public, the announcement of expensive royal wedding plans felt like a slap in the face. Elizabeth and Philip's relationship had hit its next big hurdle, public dissatisfaction over cost. George gets a letter from no less than the Camden Town branch of the um, Amalgamated Society of Woodworkers, in which they say that any unnecessary ostentation and lavishness would be an insult to British people during these particularly difficult times, warning him uh, not to allow his daughter to go ahead uh, unless it's a pretty sort of circumspect affair. Mass Observation, an independent body which monitored the public mood, picked up the hostility. I think it's a damn waste of money. I don't see why she should have everything when there are so many others who have to make do with makeshift weddings. And others can't get married at all because they have no home to go to. 
at Westminster, communist MP William Gallagher denounced the lavish expenditure in connection with this affair at a time when the masses of our people are on short rations and some are even suffering from privation. I think Willie simply opposed uh, any money, taxpayers' money, being spent uh, on any member of the royal family because they had plenty of money of their own. With little known about plans for the wedding itself, Elizabeth's wedding dress became the focus of controversy. Here, at work in time-honoured fashion, are the weavers responsible for making the silk used in Princess Elizabeth's wedding dress. With the economy in crisis, the Prime Minister was pressed to ask, was the silk for her dress British-made? Yes, Buckingham Palace retorted. The designer of the dress was the famous couturier, Norman Hartnell. I think one of your very special triumphs was the Queen's uh, wedding dress, wasn't it? I got that shirt. Oh, there you are, you see? Made of ivory satin, the dress was embroidered with seed pearls and crystals and had a 15-foot train. In a time of real hardship, it was reported as costing the equivalent of nearly 34,000 pounds today. A public poll was carried out and found that 50% of the nation thought this an extravagant waste of money. The credibility of the royal family was on the line. The royal family during the war and just after the war had made a big deal about sacrificing as much as the people. You know, the king had his ration book. There were stories of the royal family only having two inches of bath water like everyone else. And so to put on this huge, lavish display uh, seemed to some to be going against that equality of sacrifice. So they had to be very careful not to undo all that good work. In the brave new post-war world, the monarchy's legitimacy rested on consent. Without popularity, the whole institution would be vulnerable. Elizabeth and Philip's wedding was becoming the testing ground for the future role of the monarchy. Was it central to British life or just a costly irrelevance? Tom Dryberg, the Labour MP and journalist, wrote to Mountbatten to warn him that wedding tensions were rising. Mountbatten, in his role as last Viceroy of India, had his own problems. But on this question of the monarchy, he had no doubts. It really amounts to this. You've either got to give up the monarchy or give the wretched people who have to carry out the functions of the crown enough money to be able to do it with dignity. As far as Mountbatten was concerned, the criticisms were short-sighted. And in Britain, the cabinet was of the same view. The interesting thing was that the Labour government, in spite of some carping on the extreme left, they always supported the idea that the royal family shouldn't be deprived of the means of putting on a good show. Actually had the sort of common sense and understanding of the psychology of the British that it was really what was needed. And the press was happy to play its part. Stories appeared which showed that the royal family was in tune with the times and was including the nation in the preparations. The steady stream of detail was lapped up by the newspapers. The girl guides of Australia have sent the ingredients for the wedding cake. Her shoes for the ceremony will be made of white satin. Gifts of food are being redistributed to war widows with children. The press was hugely enthusiastic. It sold papers like nothing on earth. All the details were picked up on who was going to make the cake, what the plans were for the honeymoon, who was going to be invited and who was not going to be invited. One person who did have an invitation to the wedding was Mountbatten. But whether he would be able to leave India to attend it was an entirely different matter and one of absolute agony to him. He knew he had to be there if he possibly, possibly could. It was, in a way, almost the crown of his achievements. 
clearly he knew that the job of Viceroy of India was slightly more important than matchmaker for the British royal family. But in his own mind, the two things bulked almost equal. Opinion polls continued to monitor wedding protest. In July, only 40% of the country had been in favour of the wedding plans. By October, with just a month to go to the event, support had risen sharply to 60%. The nation was being seduced by the gossip and detail of the wedding preparations. There has naturally been great activity at St. James's Palace, where wedding presents have been constantly arriving from all parts of the country. The palace put a selection of Elizabeth's wedding presents on display, and the souvenir catalogue democratically listed all 2,428 of them. Presents included a racing horse from the Aga Khan and uh, hand-knitted egg cosies. And uh, what it did was it said, this is your wedding. Come and see all the presents. This is your wedding. You are part of this party. On the 19th of November, the eve of the wedding, one important guest was back in town. At the Dorchester Hotel, it was Philip Stagnite. It had been touch and go to the very last minute, but Mountbatten had made it back. I think that he only came back because of the conviction that this was something of enormous importance, which would not really almost be valid without his presence. Outside Buckingham Palace, die-hard royal supporters had begun to gather. But no one could predict what the numbers would be the following day. The morning of the wedding dawned cold and grey. There had been four months of controversy over cost, the legitimacy of the monarchy had been questioned. Would the nation be behind the wedding? This day would be the test. At 11.16, Elizabeth left Buckingham Palace with the King. Thousands of people had turned out and lined the route 50 deep. The palace and the government breathed a collective sigh of relief. They had judged the public mood right, after all. The whole thing was a, was a sort of dream, really. And especially after six years of war, of sort of gloom and despondency and dreariness. It was like an explosion of, of light and happiness coming at, at the end of this, at the end of a tunnel. And you burst into a glorious sunshine. The grumbling about cost was forgotten. This was a day off from austerity. Around Britain, millions listened in. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable... Elizabeth and Philip, a couple in love, had made it to the altar, all obstacles overcome. After an eight-year campaign, Mountbatten had achieved his ambition. His nephew was married to the future Queen of England, and he, Dickie Mountbatten, had his place in the sun. He would have felt like any other proud uncle immense satisfaction for two people whom he admired, respected and loved were marrying each other. He also felt a glow of pride in the fact that his dynastic marriage had taken place, that the Mountbatten's were now centre stage. For the nation, the day represented the hope of better things to come for everyone. As Winston Churchill wrote, the wedding was a flash of colour 
on the hard road we have to travel. It just struck a chord with people. It had a, an extraordinary psychological effect on the country. So many people had lost their love as a result of the war, either because they'd been bereaved or because their relationships and marriages had fallen apart. So in a sense, the nation was hungry for love, and this match symbolized the belief that actually things could get better. Elizabeth and Philip were now the face of a younger, more exciting future. The success of their wedding had given the monarchy a place in the post-war world which was secure, for now at least. And behind closed doors, the three characters in this story had their rewards too. Elizabeth had the man she'd wanted and would be that rare thing, a monarch who had married for love. Philip, the high-risk suitor, had his bride and his final incarnation. He was now His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. As for Mountbatten, he would continue to meddle in the life of the royal family and to matchmake for years to come.